Now we're interviewing Professor Noam Chomsky, Professor Emeritus in Department of Linguistics and Philosophy at MIT, one of the most cited sources in history. Of course, the, uh, among his many famous books is Manufacturing Consent. Recent books are Making the Future, Power Systems, and a pamphlet on Occupy Media. Professor Chomsky, great to have you on The Young Turks. Thank you. Glad to be with you again. All right. Uh, well, I want to start with this a very simple question. Is Obama a progressive? Is he what? A progressive. Progressive? Well, the way the term is used, I suppose the answer is more or less yes. But if so, it's a comment under the word progressive. I mean, he's basically... Uh, He's what used to, would have been called um, several decades ago a moderate Republican, a kind of a m mainstream centrist with uh, some concerns for uh, um, liberal ideals and conceptions, but uh, not much in the way of uh, principle or commitment. And on some issues, he's pretty reactionary. Civil liberties, for example. That goes to the question of how much American politics has changed in your lifetime. You know, you say he's a moderate Republican, and that's a point I often make on the Young Turks. Except that actually, when I was growing up, if Ronald Reagan had used drones or any other kind of bombs to execute U.S. citizens abroad without a trial, I imagine that there would have been a tremendous uproar. So isn't he in some ways much further right? And uh, then, than even Republicans were uh, a couple of decades ago. And then, what does that tell us about our current political environment? Well, that's why I said he's kind of a, what used to be a moderate Republican. Uh, moderate Republicans have more or less disappeared. Um, the Republican Party is by overwhelmingly so extreme uh, that it's hardly a traditional political party anymore. And uh, the mainstream Democrats have become pretty much what used to be called moderate Republicans. There's a couple of exceptions around the fringe, you know, people like uh, Dennis Kucinich and a couple of others, but it was no, not there anymore. But uh, uh, basically, it's, it, we have two parties, one a moderate Republican Party and the other some phenomenon that's so extreme you can hardly call it a political party. And the country, the elite uh, system that has more or less shifted with them. I mean, it's not uniform. I, 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 and I think you're right that if Reagan had been carrying out a global assassination campaign, uh, there could have been, there might have been a hue and cry, but not much. Uh, take a look at what Reagan was doing. Okay, so this morning, for example, uh, it was reported that uh, in Guatemala, uh, uh, a, a general, General Rios Montt, is being brought to trial, uh, to everyone's surprise. Uh, he's being brought to trial for crimes that he committed in the early 1980s under Reagan. Uh, they were, the Guatemalan army under his command was uh, committing a virtual genocide in the uh, Guatemalan highlands among the Mayans. Uh, uh, meanwhile, Reagan was praising him as uh, uh, a man, uh, a good man, a man totally dedicated to democracy. He's getting a bum rap from the human rights organizations who accuse him of various things, but basically a good person. We've got to keep supporting him. Uh, go back and try to find out how much protest there was. There was some. There was a solidarity movement, which was significant and important and courageous. In fact, in many ways, it uh, opened new paths in uh, opposition to state violence. It's actually the first time in the 1980s, or the first time in the history of the imperial societies, Western imperial societies, that people from uh, the imperial aggressors, the imperial society, and people from right in the mainstream, you know, the rural Kansas and places like that, were going to uh, live with the victims of the attacks in order to try to help them and even to try to protect them with just a white face. That's never happened before. Uh, well, that was really important, and it was plenty of people. But by and large, uh, a protest over the 
atrocities that and, the, and Guatemala was only one example were pretty slight. I mean, for example, how many just do a small census in your you know study in your own group of friends or in wherever you are now, and ask them, uh, can you name the uh, uh, Latin American intellectuals, Jesuit priests, who were assassinated in 1989 in El Salvador? And, uh, and, and how were they assassinated? Just ask people. I mean, if that had happened in Czechoslovakia, we'd probably had a nuclear war. But it happened in El Salvador. Uh, was done by U.S. trained forces under the uh, 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 under the specific orders of the high command, close touch with the American embassy. Uh, six leading Latin American intellectuals, Jesuit priests, uh, had their brains blown out uh, at the university, which was attacked by the army. Well, does anybody know? Uh, try it and see. That gives you a sense of how much protest there was. It was real, but limited. Professor Chomsky, that goes to the uh, role of the media in this country, because it was not talked about very much back then. And today, President Obama's signature strikes, the double taps, the execution of U.S. citizens without a trial, is also not talked about very much. So that leads to two fundamental questions. Why does the media not talk about it much? And what is the system that gets them to all somehow agree without presumably going into a smoke-filled room that there shall be this, as you call it, uh, in some ways, a manufactured consent? Well, first of all, notice that the media do report it. So, for example, the uh, drone killing uh, which attacked uh, 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 Awlaki in Yemen, an American citizen, uh, which killed him and also killed another American citizen who happened to be in the car with him and a couple of weeks later killed his son, also an American citizen. That was reported. Uh, in fact, look back at the report. So the New York Times had a report and the headline was something like uh, West celebrates death of uh, uh, radical um, Muslim cleric. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we celebrate the death of this radical cleric by a targeted assassination, which happens to be a crime, uh, and he happens to be an American citizen, as does the guy sitting next to him. Uh, so it's not that it's not reported. And the same, uh, um, the same with many other cases. They're kind of reported, but they're reported as if they're just and right, and then we turn to the next topic. Uh, now that's not, you can't blame the media for that. They are reflecting, I'm talking about the liberal media, incidentally, not Fox News. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's much more interesting to look at what are called, you know, whether you like the term or not, what are called the liberal media, the ones who are kind of at the outer limits of critical discussion. They're much more interesting. Uh, they tell you something about the the framework of discussion that's imposed internally, without coercion, by the uh, uh, educated sectors of the population. And uh, they, those are the beliefs. You, you can't go beyond these beliefs. Uh, well, okay, there's, uh, it was the same with the uh, drone attacks altogether. Uh, there was, uh, the, um, you probably saw the long article in the New York Times by Scott Chain and someone else, I forget, uh, uh, probably based on leaks from the White House, uh, who are proud of it, about the uh, drone assassination campaign. Long, detailed discussion of how it works. And, the killers, and yeah. basic. Remember that? Yep. Yeah. Well. Okay. It was. It was there. It wasn't hidden. You know, in the morning, uh, uh, Obama and his uh, national security advisor John Brennan, a former priest. Uh, get together and you know read a couple of chapters of uh, uh, Saint uh, Saint Augustine on just war and then decide who they're going to kill that day uh, and uh, maybe the, uh, the criteria for killing them are uh, if there's a group of men uh, gathered together somewhere uh, we'll presume that they're terrorists and kill them with a drone attack and they're guilty unless it's proven later uh, 
uh, that they were innocent, then we concede that they were innocent. But first we kill them, and then it's their, you know, the task of survivors to prove that they were innocent. That was described. Uh, uh, there was some protest about it, uh, mostly because of what you mentioned before, killing Americans, or killing other people, doesn't matter that much. But there was some protest. And in fact, the uh, Eric Holder, the uh, the Justice Department secretary was uh, asked uh, whether this kind of uh, killing doesn't violate our sacred principles as embodied in the uh, Fifth Amendment that uh, uh, no person can, a person is presumed innocent unless proven guilty as with due process in a court of law, Fifth and Sixth Amendments. That goes back to Magna Carta in 1215. And Holder said, yeah, this is this is consistent with it. Uh, they do have due process because uh, it's discussed within the executive branch. I mean, you know, King John of England uh, back in the 13th century, who was compelled to sign uh, the Magna Carta Char- Charter of Liberties, he'd be delighted that due process means we talked about it among ourselves. Uh, well, it's reported, uh, but there's barely any reaction. And uh, you don't expect reaction from the general public because they probably don't even know about it. Yeah, not everybody reads uh, long stories in the New York Times. But educated people read it, and they don't react. I mean, very few of them do. So, Actually, Scott Chain, Scott Chain had an interesting article afterwards responding to the limited criticism and uh, justifying the drone attacks. And the last, he ended up his article in an interesting way. He said, well, uh, even if you think there's something wrong with these, it's a lot better than Dresden, after all. Uh, so in other words, the choices are between, you know, wiping out some city and killing tens of thousands of people or a targeted assassination campaign. Those are the choices. Are there some other choices you can imagine? No. You know, it's not part of anytime I want to excuse any action of mine, uh, I've now got the line better than Dresden. So that's right. Yeah, yeah. now it's a wonderful what, line, uh, Professor Chomsky. What I'm really curious about, though, is how they set the boundaries of what you call acceptable thought. What is the process by which that happens? They seem to all magically agree. But yet there is no, I don't believe there's a smoke-filled room where they all got together and said, okay, now these are the boundaries and this is what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. How no. does that happen? Look, I think you know. You went to school. You went to a university. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is what you heard all your life from teachers, from uh, uh, fellow students, uh, uh, what you saw in the newspapers. Uh, how did they do it? Well, you know, you just get, you internalize the doctrines that are convenient. It's it's very easy to come to believe things that it's convenient to believe. Actually, we all know this from our personal lives. You know, everybody's done something that they know some wasn't really right. But you make up some justification for it. It's much easier to live with yourself if you can find a framework that justifies what you're doing. Uh and uh, uh, people fall into it pretty naturally. Uh, those, not everyone. So some people kind of object to it. You know, maybe there are kids in school who object to it, and uh, at, at college they object to it, and then the professions they object to it. Uh, they're usually marginalized in some fashion. They're uh, anti-American. They're uh, sympathetic to terrorism. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, vilifications that you can used to be their pro-communist, uh, their Marxists, you know, uh, and so they're vilified and marginalized. They're not in the United States. They're not killed. They're not sent to prison. It's a free country, uh, but uh, uh, it's just a lot easier to conform and to obey and to repeat. And uh, I'm sure you've been through it your whole life. Everyone is. Me too. Well, uh, I, I've had a notable case of it at MSNBC where I uh, apparently was challenging the Democratic Party and the establishment too much and hence, you know, got moved out in some way. And, uh, and yeah. I think that's, it's those subtle moves. That's, that's exactly right. Right. Yeah. Levers but of power. Take the people you were, who were there. I mean, how did they internalize it? 
that you're supposed to support the Democratic Party. Well, you know, it's just uh, uh, it's easier that way. Mm -hmm. So then let's go back to the political system here. Because, you know, we talked about earlier here that the system seems to have shifted even more right, so the Democratic Party has now become the moderate Republican Party. What do you think is the main underlying reason for that shift? Why is that shift even further right uh, happening? Well, I, I don't think it's really, I think it has, it's a reflection of the redesign of the economy since the 1970s. Uh, uh, in, uh, from the 1970s, for all kinds of reasons, uh, there was a real reshaping of the economy. And the design is correct. There were alternative po policies. These are the ones that were taken. Now, there were two major elements of it. One was a shift towards financialization. Uh, you go back to before, actually before the 1980s. Uh, banks, uh, there weren't even many interstate banks. Banking was mostly a local phenomenon. Uh, banks were what banks are supposed to be in a state capitalist system. They take your deposits and uh, you know lend them to somebody who wants to buy a car or send his kid to college or start a business or whatever it may be. Uh, that's what a bank was, and they operated essentially locally. Uh, starting in the 1970s, particularly since the 1980s, they began to grow enormously. Uh, the, by the time you get to the latest crash, 19, 2007, uh, financial institutions were making about 40% of corporate profits. Well, at the same time, manufacturing, this is a related development, uh, manufacturing was moving towards offshoring, you know, producing things in uh, northern Mexico or southeastern China instead of the United States. It's more profitable, you have cheaper labor, you don't have to worry about limited environmental constraints and so on. So you have these two tendencies getting started, and they have consequences. The one consequence was a very sharp concentration of wealth. It's not a big secret that since then, wealth in the United States has concentrated enormously. By now, you know, it's like in a top tenth of one percent of the population is absolutely fabulous wealth. And while for the rest of the pop, for the majority of the population, it's been a period of uh, stagnation and uh, uh, or sometimes decline. Now, people get by by longing, longer working hours. People here work many more hours than in Europe or even Japan uh, by debt. Uh, uh, and but you know uh, benefits are very weak and they've been weakened even further. Uh, that's the you know in the Occupy imagery that's the 99 percent and the one percent a very sharp concentration of wealth. Along with uh, the, uh, concentration of wealth leads very quickly to concentration of political power. I mean it's by now it's you know so obvious you can't even. Debate it, but it's always been true that uh, 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 money was a major factor, if not the major factor, in winning an election. Uh, you go back a century, and uh, uh, the great uh, party manager and propagandist Mark Hanna uh, was asked, uh, "What's imp this is a century ago? What's what's important in an electoral campaign?" And he said, "There are three things. Uh, the first is money. The second is money." And I've forgotten what the third one is. Now, that's a century ago. By now, it's, it's so dramatic that we hardly have to talk about it. The last election was uh, just for president was over two billion dollars, which is unheard of. Uh, well, as uh, uh, as uh, 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 campaigns are increasingly uh, bought, the political figures become more and more have to climb deeper and deeper into the pockets of those who are funding them. And with all the talk about small contributions, if you look closely, the funders are highly concentrated uh, among the very wealthy and among big institutions. Uh, and so sure, you become um, beholden to them. And that leads to legislation, uh, which uh, drives the vicious cycle onward, uh, deregulation, uh, 
you know, the too big to fail uh, legislation to bail out, so which began under Reagan, and uh, you know, on and on. Uh, rules of corporate governance were changed to essentially allow CEOs to pick their own uh, the, the panels that would set their own salaries. That leads to uh, changing business decisions so that you try to aim for the very high profits in the next quarter. Don't worry about what happens next, and uh, and you get a big bonus, and so on and so forth. Now, that leads to the uh, one of the effects of this is what you described. Both parties shift right. Uh, they so, that's part of uh, the you know that's part of the uh, shredding of the democratic system uh, by the increasing power of extreme wealth. So, I mean, now it's to the point that you, you take a look at the political science literature, uh, which has some uh, pretty careful and good studies. Uh, one of the things they study is uh, intensively is polls, you know, at it, people's attitudes, and it, and then you can compare that with policies, and the figures are pretty striking. Uh, so, for example, it turn, uh, good studies that show that. About 70% of the population have no influence on policy whatsoever, no matter what they think. That's the lower 70% in wealth and income. As you move up the income wealth ladder, you get a little bit more influence. And at the very top, which is a tiny group, you basically get what you want. So as the political system gets shredded, uh, wealth gets concentrated, uh, uh, other policies change accordingly. Uh, you get a, drift, a natural drift of the parties to the right. So, you know, as you stated, you know, we've had this problem with money in politics for over a hundred years, but yet, FDR, for example, managed to represent the will of the people to some degree in a lot of issues in a way that, when you look back now at what he said, it would be unimaginable for a politician today to say those things and, and to get those bills passed, etc. So, is it the fact that? Money in politics has become, instead of sometimes illegal bribery, a legalized form of bribery that has actually made it more efficient and made it more powerful in politics today as opposed to the past. Uh, first of all, it's, even if you look back at Roosevelt, it's not what you're saying is correct. I mean, uh, Roosevelt would be off the spectrum today, but so would Nixon. You know, uh, Nixon's views were would be far too liberal today for uh, the Republican Party and maybe for the Democratic Party uh, and Eisenhower's even more so. Uh, that's part of the drift of the right. But uh, uh, that's but even in Roosevelt's time, I mean, the best work on this topic, if you really want to look into it, is the work by uh, Tom Ferguson, who's a very good political scientist, done the major work on uh, the role of money in politics. And he points out that uh, Roosevelt was supported by a big sector, an important sector of uh, private capital, uh, mainly uh, capital-intensive, uh, internationally-oriented industry, like, say, General Electric. Uh, they supported Roosevelt, uh, all kind of reasons for that. So he, uh, he, he, he was opposed by... Uh, 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 labor-intensive, uh, more domestically-oriented capital, like uh, you know, low-level manufacturing, low-level manufacturing, or serv uh, so on, small businesses. But uh, so, so there was a, a, a class split within the business class in the Roosevelt time. But nevertheless, uh, the important point is that uh, there were mass popular movements, like the labor movement was picking up. It had been pretty much crushed. Uh, by Woodrow Wilson by the 1920s, it was almost dead. Uh, but it picked up in the 1930s. And when you started getting CI the organizing of the CIO, you know, big industrial union and militant labor actions and, you know, sit-down strikes and things like that, then everybody had to take notice. And uh, that, plus other kinds of popular activism, uh, were a major force that Roosevelt could rely on to pass uh, progressive legislation. Uh, well, you know, since the Second World War, after the, as soon as it was over, there was a major business offensive launched to try to destroy the unions, uh, to try to destroy the labor movement. They understand perfectly well that that's uh, 
the core part of a, a democratic popular constituency. It's not the first time in American history. It goes way back, but there's been a major campaign since the Second World War, and by now it's been pretty successful. Uh, the labor movement has been defanged. Uh, uh, labor uh, uh, in private sector unions, unionization is you know like below seven percent. It's still there, but it's much weaker, and being attacked constantly by a very class-conscious business class who are able to dominate uh, public discussion and media discussion. I mean, take, for example, the one extremely striking development just in the last few months uh, in the state of uh, Michigan, you know, a labor stronghold from way back, where they were able to pass something called a right-to-work law. Well, you know, that's, that's good propaganda. A right-to-work law is, in fact, a right-to-scrounge law. It's not a right-to-work law. It's a right to get the benefits of a union without paying union dues. That's what right-to-work means. But, of course, if you describe it that way, you're not going to get any support for it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you call it a right-to-work law, and uh, people are pounded with propaganda about people should have a right to work. Well, yeah, then you get uh, you can get even you can get even a good part of the labor vote. Uh, that's the kind of propaganda that's uh, propagated by the media, kind of unthinkingly, they, not on purpose. Particularly, it's just kind of internalized, like repeating patriotic propaganda, and it uh, over time has an effect, big effect. And this is uh, very sophisticated. And quite conscious class war by a highly class conscious business community. The United States has always had a very class conscious business community, always fighting a, a bitter class war and uh, with a lot of success and a lot of influence. Now, you don't have, if you have the popular movements to oppose it, uh, then it's possible for a Roosevelt to appear. But uh, without them, it's going to be very hard, uh, especially because of the it's, it's uh, magnified by the changes of the last couple of decades uh, towards the uh, extremely high concentration of uh, of uh, wealth and uh, uh, the uh, what I described before the kind of shredding of the political system. So, so it's you know, hard. Can't, it's not impossible. It's hard work. So that leads to that critical question, Professor Chomsky. How do we fight back? How do we win? We fight back the way they did in the 1930s, the way the populist movement did in the 1890s, and the labor movement then uh, finally defeated, but not without a lot of victories. Uh, the way the civil rights movement uh, worked, again, with significant victories, though certainly not what Martin Luther King was trying to achieve. Uh, you, you organize. You try first. You have to educate, like what you're doing on, you know, to, on your activities. Uh, then you have to, which includes educating yourself, and then you have to try to organize, get people mobilized to do something, uh, as say the Occupy movement did and has done and may, might continue to do, and then carry out uh, uh, actions of the kind that. Uh, uh, threaten power and require a response, like, say, uh, CIO sit-down st strikes. And there are plenty of other things you can do. So, for, for example, some things are going on kind of quietly in the country, uh, which have potentially a kind of, you know, even revolutionary implications. Uh, the growth and development of uh, uh, cooperatives and uh, worker-owned enterprises, for example. It's not on a huge scale. But it's on a significant scale and spreading, and those are what could be uh, the germs of a new society, a very different society, uh, undermining uh, the capitalist uh, social and economic relations. Well, all of those, uh, on all sorts of fronts, there are things that can be done, and sometimes they're successful. I mean, for example... You know, the 1960s, 60s activism uh, had quite a civilizing effect on the country. It did evoke uh, 
tremendous backlash from the 1970s, and we're living in the midst of that backlash. But uh, there are plenty of achievements. Many of them were carried forward. Uh, some are being carried forward right now. Let's say the advance of uh, gay rights, or much too limited, but at least some concern about the environment. Uh, all of those things are developing. They can go further. So there's no shortage of things to do. The, the kinds of tasks that have always been in front of people who wanted to make a better world, uh, not easy ones, but they're not impossible either. There's successes in the past that we can build on. If there was one thing that we could do to get help from the top, so for example, if President Obama came to you and said, all right, Professor Chomsky, uh, I'm going to grant you one wish. <laughs> uh, you tell me what to do on this one issue and I'll do it. What would it be? Well, well, first of all, you know, on the unimaginable circumstances <laughs> that this could happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, if, if I told him what I thought, and he even agreed to do it, he would very quickly be shot down by powerful forces. Do you so, mean literally or meta? Me, no, well, you know, maybe even literally. Be, you know, there was an attempt, to, a business attempt to kill Roosevelt. It was stopped. But I don't mean literally, but though that could happen too, but just uh, beaten back by forces much too powerful than the president. Uh, concentrated economic power, for example. But there are things that really should be done. Like there has to be, you know, the, the human species, if you look at it in a broader, you know, from, from kind of, you know, imagine you're on Mars watching what's happening here. You can see the human species marching towards self-destruction. I mean, for the first time in history, human history, we're now at a point where we can destroy the possibilities for decent human existence. And in fact, we're marching towards exactly that. Uh, in part, there's two major issues. One of them has both been around for a long time. Uh, one is the threat of nuclear war, which is quite serious. In many ways, it's getting worse. And uh, we know how to deal with it if the proper measures are taken. And I could, if we have time, I could go through some of them, but they're real. Uh, the other is uh, the threat of environmental destruction. Uh, you know, we're coming to a point where... We may be past the point where um, it's even possible to do anything. You know, we don't know when, but it's getting worse and uh, uh, very serious. And uh, we're not—we're doing very little. In fact, in many ways, going going backwards. Uh, well, okay, these are uh, these are two extremely dangerous processes, which, if the president had the power and wanted to do it, uh, he could deal with. But those are two big ifs, and it would take a lot of popular uh, uh, pressure and activism to bring the country to the point where something really significant could be done on these issues. All right, and I, I wanted to ask you on an unrelated note uh, to the political uh, scenarios and circumstances that we've been uh, discussing. It, you're, of course, a longtime professor at MIT. MIT now involved in this Aaron Swartz saga. Of course, that's the young man who uh, committed suicide when MIT pursued charges against him. Have you put thought into uh, the culpability of MIT there, and, and do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, well, to be precise, uh, MIT didn't pursue charges against him. MIT was culpable, in my opinion, but for what they didn't do, MIT didn't intervene to try to block the charges. But the charges weren't coming from MIT. Uh, MIT did uh, provide uh, the police with the information that someone broke into the uh, uh, computer system. But, you know, that you'd expect. Uh, then came these extremely harsh charges by the prosecuting attorney here. And what MIT should have done, I think, is to have taken some initiative to protest the uh, severity of the charges. And they didn't. And I think they're culpable for that. But it's not quite accurate to say that they pursued the charges against him, that they kind of left in the hands of the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. uh, and is there any action that they should take now? Uh, in, yeah, there's, in uh, yeah, there's, uh, uh, in fact, the Institute, it's been 
there's been pressure on the administration to do something from the faculty, from students, from others. And there are several things underway. Uh, there are plans for teach-ins. The president of the uh, institute has already made statements saying we've got to look into what we did and what we did wrong and think about it and take some steps. Uh, there's, uh, there is a faculty inquiry underway led by a good person. Uh, so all of these things are in process and they may lead to some serious thinking of the issues involved, of, not only in this particular case, but the underlying issues. There's some serious issues involved. Mm-hmm. So just it, let's pretend, if we can, that this terrible tragedy didn't take place, okay, and just ask what uh, Aaron Schwartz was trying to do. Uh, he was trying to uh, liberate a uh, JSTOR. A JSTOR makes uh, scholarly articles available to subscribers, mostly universities, university libraries. Uh, okay, suppose you liberate JSTOR, you know, so everything they have is now publicly available. Well, you know, in our society, that means they go out of business, and that means they don't make anything available. Well, suppose you take the next step and say, okay, let's liberate the journals and the publishers. Let's put all of their stuff in the public domain. Well, that sounds good, but in our society, in the world we live in, that means they're going to go out of business and nothing will be available. So the end result of these efforts is to make nothing available. Mm -hmm. Well, there are ways around this, but you have to break out of the constraints of uh, our kind of um, the pathologies of our society. The obvious way out of this is to have uh, creative work subsidized by the general community, which means by the government. That's how creative work ought to be subsidized. The same with music. So, you know, liberating music from the Internet sounds, you know, radical, except for the fact that musicians aren't going to be able to survive. Uh, If creative work is paid for, is subsidized, is part of our social obligations, which means, you know, as current, current, institutions, that means working through the government, uh, then you can deal with these problems. But you have to go at least that far. Right. And there are quite concrete proposals to do that. Uh, just saying, well, okay, let's make everything free, uh, that doesn't deal with the problem. I, I actually totally agree with you on that. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned the pathologies of societies, uh, of our society there. And I want to ask you one more broad question in that light. Do you think we're ever going to get to that point where we have gotten beyond those pathologies and and get to a a state that, in your writings, you would prefer? Uh, Do you think we're ever going to get there, or is the human nature and the greed involved in it too strong and will always block it? Well, I think we've, you know, in many ways, made a lot of progress towards getting there. Uh, Not in this particular domain. Here there's regression. But... uh, Mutual aid, mutual support, solidarity, uh, uh, concern for others, uh, uh, these are parts of human nature. And very often they've been realized in very successful ways. So like, take, say, the labor movement. Uh, One reason why the business world and uh, elite elements in general are so anti-labor is that those are precisely the values that the labor movement sponsored at its best, not at its worst when it was run by, you know, uh, mafia gangsters and so on, but at its best, it, it it was based on the on conceptions of solidarity and mutual support and even international solidarity. Now, that's why the unions are called internationals. Now you can talk about all the limitations in trying to achieve those objectives, but that's what lies behind it, and that's what lies behind the successes of the labor movement, which were quite real, like the New Deal legislation. Uh, but uh, so it's not beyond human nature. It's uh, a part of our capacities in many respects. We've moved forward in these dimensions and other respects not, uh, sometimes backwards. But uh, I don't see any reason to think that... Uh, I mean, if you look at the trajectory over the past couple of centuries, I think it's been basically towards progress, towards expanding the domain of rights and justice, 
So, I mean, it takes a, it takes a women's right, you know, it's half the population. Uh, when this country was founded, uh, at the time of the, of the Constitution, uh, women were considered, literally considered to be property. A woman was the property in law. A woman was the property of her father and then of her husband. That's British common law, codified by Blackstone. You know, uh, one of the, back at the time of the Constitutional Convention, one of the arguments given against allowing women to vote was that it was unfair to married men, to unmarried men, because a married man would have two votes, his own and his properties, and you couldn't have that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, if you look at American law, that goes up till pretty recently in one form or another. So, for example, it wasn't until the uh, 1970s, and that's under the impact of the activist movements, it wasn't until the 1970s that women had a, a guaranteed right to serve on federal juries because they weren't considered peers. Okay, this all, ex- by now, th- you know, things are by no means perfect. There's plenty wrong. But there's been a, a very substantial progress, slow, but significant and growing. And the same has happened in other respects. I mean, uh, uh, concern of the environment, uh, animal rights, gay rights, uh, uh, the global justice issues, which really have just become uh, and the, you know, part of the mainstream activism, at least in the nineteen in the last decade or so, uh, these are all steps forward, and I don't see any reason why they should stop. So, in the through arc of, this regression, yeah. So, in the arc of history, uh, you've been to the mountaintop and see the glory of the coming of the Lord. Well, I think, uh, as Martin Luther King put it, the uh, arc, the arc is bending upwards, you know, slowly and not without regression. So we keep it going that way. <laughs> Professor Chomsky, great okay. conversation. Thank you so much yep. for joining us on the Young Turks. Really deeply yep. appreciate it. Good to talk to you. Bye.